Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, June 7, 2024. President Joe Biden meets Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in France, apologizing for the holdup of U.S. military aid that is now flowing and announces a new package to counter Russian invasion forces. President Biden also speaks at the Ranger Monument at Point du Hoc in Normandy, invoking the war in Ukraine, saying democracy begins with each of us, that it's hard. And of the troops who took out the German gun positions on D-Day 80 years ago, they're not asking us to scale these cliffs, but they're asking us to stay true to what America stands for. Former President Donald Trump, who will face President Biden in this year's presidential election, takes a different approach as he talks about the war in Ukraine and U.S. foreign policy at a campaign rally in Phoenix. And we'll hear from Libertarian Party presidential nominee Oliver Chase in a C-SPAN interview. White House puts up unscalable fencing to prepare for a large pro-Palestinian protest on Saturday. Labor Department says the U.S. economy added 272,000 jobs in May, and the unemployment rate rose from 3.9 percent to 4 percent. Vice President Kamala Harris campaigns with Maryland Senate Democratic nominee Angela Alsobrooks on preventing gun violence. The Radiation Exposure Compensation Program expires today because of disagreements in Congress over whether to extend it as is or with an expansion of who can get benefits. And Senator Cory Booker says farewell to the current class of Senate pages, those high school junior helpers, with a poem he wrote about their time in Washington. From the New York Times, President Biden used the backdrop of the beaches of Normandy on Friday to argue that defending democracy in Ukraine and around the world in 2024 is as vital as the day that American troops joined the Allies on D-Day to begin rescuing Europe from the grip of Hitler's tyranny. He said, as we gather here today, it's not just to honor those who showed such remarkable bravery that day, June 6, 1944. It's to listen to the echo of their voices, to hear them, because they're summoning us. They're not asking us to scale these cliffs, Mr. Biden added during the remarks at the edge of the same cliff where Ronald Reagan delivered a similar speech on democracy four decades ago. They're asking us to stay true to what America stands for. Mr. Biden delivered the speech just hours after he apologized to President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine for the months-long delay in approving military aid, blaming it on conservative Republican opposition. That was from the New York Times. And that's where we begin President Biden meeting President Zelensky in Paris. You haven't bowed down. You haven't yielded at all. You continue to fight in a way that is uh, is just remarkable. Just remarkable. And uh, I'm not going to walk away from you. I apologize for the uh, those weeks of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of funding, <laughs> because uh, we had trouble getting the a bill that we had to pass that had the money in it from some of our very conservative members who were holding it up. But we got it done finally. And uh, since then, including today, I've announced six packages of significant funding. Today, I'm also signing an additional package for $225 million to help you reconstruct the, the electric grid. And. Uh, and uh, but once we got the national security bill passed, that uh, was a political issue. Um, we were able to get it all done. And uh, the way you've stood and holding on and holding on in Kharkiv, and uh, you're proving once again the people of Ukraine cannot and will never be overtaken. President Biden meeting Ukrainian President Zelensky in Paris, France, that money coming from the $61 billion for Ukraine in the larger national security supplemental spending bill that the president signed in April. President Zelensky thanked President Biden for the aid and for recent changes authorizing Ukraine to use U.S. weapons to attack inside Russia near the border with Ukraine under certain circumstances. And our meeting here is very symbolic. It's very important that you stay with us. This bipartisan support with the Congress, it's very important that in this unity, United States, America, all American people stay with Ukraine. Like it was during World War II, how United States helped to save human lives, to save Europe. And we count on your continuing support and standing with us shoulder to shoulder. Thank you so much. And uh, this big package which has been signed it and supported and voted 
and uh, it's very important. It's so necessary for for this for the feeling of our people that we are not alone. We are with you, with our strategic partner. And of course, we are, I want today to, to speak about strengthening of Kharkiv region. You said already it's, it's so important, and your decisions have been very very. Um, had a very positive influence. I don't want to share it everything, all the details with press, sorry, but, but I think uh, there are some details on the battlefield which, you, which you, you, you need to hear from us. We are thankful for this. Ukrainian President Zelensky with President Biden in Paris. Later, White House spokesperson John Kirby, during a virtual audio news conference, was asked about what President Zelensky meant when he said that he needed to tell President Biden about those battlefield conditions. Our next question will go to Sung Min with AP. Hey guys, thanks for holding the call. Um, I just wanted to follow up on um, comments that President Zelensky made this morning during the bilat. He told the president that there are details on the battlefield you need to hear from us. Um, can you elaborate on what, um, to the extent that you can, what President Zelensky told President Biden and particularly about uh, progress or, or changes on the battlefield, especially since the additional U.S. aid started arriving in recent weeks? Yeah, the I, I won't go into too much detail here. I hope you can understand that because I don't want to talk about um, things that might make it harder for Ukraine to defend itself on the battlefield. I mean, he, he shared a very frank assessment with uh, President Biden about um, what's going on and the pressure that they remain under, particularly in the east, uh, in, in the Donbass. Um, uh, but I think it's safe to say that while they are still under pressure from the Russians, particularly in the East, that because they have now been able to receive the benefits of five security packages and now six coming, as the president announced today, uh, that they have been able to thwart Russian advances, particularly uh, around Kharkiv. Uh, the, the Russians really have kind of stalled out up there. It's, it's basically... Uh, their advance on Kharkiv is is uh, uh, all but over um, because they ran into the first line of defenses of the Ukrainian armed forces and basically stopped, um, if not pulled back some units. Now I, I say that uh, with a, a dose of humility, you, you, because you you know uh, the enemy gets a vote, and um, right now the, the, it certainly appears that they've they've stalled out. But we we can't nor will the Ukrainians, you know, take anything for granted. Uh, they want to be able to not just stop the Russians, but push the Russians back. Um, and so he did share with the president, again, his frank assessment, as he has always shared his frank assessment of how things are going on the battlefield and what they need. Um, and the president, as you heard publicly, and he certainly did this privately, assured uh, President Zelensky that they'll continue to have our support. John Kirby, White House National Security Communications Advisor in an online audio news conference traveling with the president in France. President Biden went back to Normandy today to the Point de Hoc Ranger Monument. CNN writes, President Biden on Friday summoned Americans to a defense of democracy, calling on the ideals of the army rangers who scaled the cliffs of Point de Hoc 80 years ago to warn against a drift toward authoritarianism and drawing an implicit contrast with rival Donald Trump. Speaking from a concrete bunker where the U.S. troops sought to dismantle German artillery, Biden said those men, none of whom are still alive today, would want their modern-day fellow citizens to do their part to protect against autocrats. Reporting from CNN, here's President Biden. American democracy asks the hardest of things, to believe that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So democracy begins with each of us. It begins when one person decides there's something more important than themselves. When they decide the person they're serving alongside of is someone to look after. When they decide the mission matters more than their life. When they decide that their country matters more than they do. That's what the Rangers at Port uh, Palm Point to Hawk did. That's what they decided. That's what every soldier and every Marine who stormed this beach has decided. A feared dictator had conquered a continent, had finally met his match. Because of them, the war turned. They stood against Hitler's aggression. 
Does anyone doubt? Does anyone doubt that they would want America to stand up against Putin's aggression here in Europe today? They stormed the beaches alongside their allies. Does anyone believe these rangers would want America to go it alone today? They fought to vanquish a hateful ideology in the 30s and 40s. Does anyone doubt they wouldn't move heaven and earth to vanquish hateful ideologies of today? These rangers put mission and country above themselves. Does anyone believe they would exact any less from every American today? These rangers remembered with reverence those who gave their lives in battle. Could they or anyone ever imagine that America would do the same, wouldn't do the same? They believed America was the beacon to the world. I'm certain they believed that it would be that way forever. You know, we stand today where we stand was not sacred ground on June the 5th. But that's what it became on June the 6th. The Rangers who scaled this cliff didn't know they would change the world, but they did. I've long said that history has shown that ordinary Americans can do extraordinary things when challenged. There's no better example of that in the entire world than right here at Point de Hoc. President Biden at the Point de Hoc Ranger Monument on the cliff, Normandy, France. From a Reuters article, by setting his speech at Point de Hoc, Biden echoed Republican predecessor Ronald Reagan, who marked D-Day's anniversary there 40 years ago. Reagan said democracy was worth dying for and emphasized an American desire for peace in what turned out to be the waning years of the Cold War. President Biden will be staying in France Saturday for an official visit to that country, meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron. Several dozen U.S. House members and senators were in France this week for the D-Day 80th anniversary. Today, eight congressmen who are military veterans parachuted out of a Douglas C-47 Skytrain plane. Daryl Issa of California was asked why on Fox News Channel on Thursday. Congressman, uh, you're flanked by Corey Corey Mills and uh, Ronnie Jackson. Uh, All three of you are going to do a a jump tomorrow, I believe. Uh, Why are you jumping out of a plane? (laughs) Well, all three of us were paratroopers in our previous uh, lives. And so we we have the experience, the training, we've requalified. But most importantly, we wanted to be part of thanking and replicating what the greatest generation did. When the 82nd Airborne came in and the 101st Airborne, they did so knowing that their chances of survival were even less than those hitting the beach. But they did so, and they did so valley, you know, gallantly. Congressman Darrell Issa, Republican from California, sitting beside Corey Mills, Republican of Florida, and Ronnie Jackson, Republican of Texas, on Fox News Channel on Thursday. And the others who parachuted today were Republicans Mike Walls of Florida, Dan Crenshaw of Texas, Rich McCormick of Georgia, Mark Green of Tennessee, and Democrat Jason Crow of Colorado. Washington Post Dana Milbank writes, the 80th anniversary of D-Day on Thursday provided the contrast that should define the election. President Biden went to Normandy and spoke about American greatness. Donald Trump went to Phoenix and called the United States a failed nation and a very sick country. Biden hailed NATO, the, quote, greatest military alliance in the history of the world, and vowed to defend Ukraine. He said to bow down to dictators is simply unthinkable. Were we to do that, it means we'd be forgetting what happened here on these hallowed beaches. Trump hailed a modern-day tyrant, Hungary's Viktor Orban, calling him a strong man, very powerful man, complained about endless wars and delinquent Europeans, and vowed to speed our money in our country, including by moving thousands of troops, if necessary, currently stationed overseas to our own borders. That was from Washington Post. Here is an audience question to Donald Trump on Thursday in Phoenix. President Trump, it's an honor. Thank um, you. I enlisted in the uh, Army Reserve because I love my country, like many of us do. Right. Um, under Biden, our national security is at risk with endless wars. What is your plan to bring us back to peace? So, it's actually a good question. So, you know, when I ran against Hillary Clinton, I don't use the word crooked anymore. I don't use the word anymore. I, I, I don't do it. Because I, I removed that word. I used it for Joe. I thought it was more accurate. Then I had Sleepy Joe, and I removed it into Crooked Joe. I thought it was slightly more accurate. But we had 
a situation going with all of these people, everything. They wanted to do, they wanted to say that I was going to create World War III. I was, look at him, look at him, he's a radical, look at him. I was a radical for not having wars. And if you look at Victor, Victor Orban from Hungary, strong country, strong man. He's a very powerful man, very, runs it strong. He didn't take, he didn't take illegal aliens. He didn't want them. He said, I want my people to be Hungarian. I don't want to have my shopping centers blown up, et cetera, et cetera. And they asked him a few weeks ago, they said, let me ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, What's going on with the world? The world is blowing up. You have Ukraine, Russia, you have Israel, you have all these places that are at war with each other. What's going on? He said, there's one thing going on. He said, Donald Trump isn't president. If Trump is president, it's all going to end. They all respected Trump, and it's true, and it's true. So they said that, oh, look at – Hillary said this – Look at Trump. Just look at this guy. He's going to go to war. He's going to take us. No, no. Look at me. I'm the one that kept us out of war. For 78 years, it was 78 years until another president. Look, that's a long time. I kept you out of wars. I totally defeated ISIS. I rebuilt our military. And countries respected us. I totally rebuilt our military. And I rebuilt our Veterans Administration. I took good care of our vets. 92 percent approval rate. So we are going to — we are going to uh, make sure there's no wars. We don't want to have wars. I call them endless wars. I call them wars where people don't even want us involved. Now, Ukraine's a very interesting case because we spend hundreds of billions of dollars. And Europe — you know, don't forget, we have a little thing called an ocean in between us. Europe should be paying much more. Nobody asks them to pay more. I asked them to pay more for NATO, and they paid a lot more. That's where they got all the money, because they were all mostly delinquent, other than eight nations. But they would always say Trump is going to get us into war with his attitude. No, my attitude kept us out of war. We defeated ISIS, totally defeated ISIS. We got out of Syria. We got out of Iraq. I got out of these wars because I'm a big believer. I want to spend our money in our country, doing our country's great things. Donald Trump, former president and Republican presidential candidate, expected to be the party's nominee this year and run against the Democratic expected nominee, current president Joe Biden. Donald Trump at a rally in Phoenix hosted by the group Turning Point USA on Thursday. Foreign policy and war, also topics that came up in C-SPAN's interview this morning with Libertarian Party presidential nominee Oliver Chase. What prompted you to run for president? Well, you know, I thought it was time for us to have uh, more voices and more choices on our political system. You know, the electorate is really just sick and tired of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and that's what we've been given from the two-party system as a repeat of 2020. And voters want something fresh, they want something new, and they want something bold. And that is the message of liberty, uh, the message that if you're living your life in peace, uh, you're not harming anybody else, your life's your life, your body's your body, your business is your business, and your property is your property. It's not mine and it's not the government's, and I think that's something a lot of voters can find refreshing. What does a libertarian administration look like in, in its work and what it does if you were to become president? How would things change? Well, the first thing you're going to know is uh, that if I enter the office of the presidency, the office of president will be a weaker office when I leave than when I, when I take uh, office. And that's because so much of what the president has done uh, over my lifetime is a result of the legislature just kind of falling asleep at the wheel and giving so much executive overreach to the president. And so mine would be one that exercises the presidency within constitutional bounds, uh, but also seeks to do things like balancing our budget at least, if we can't get it lower than that, and really making drastic changes to our priorities both at home and abroad uh, in a way that respects the Constitution and the individual rights and civil liberties of all. Uh, to that last point, we were talking earlier in the day about America's role in the world, particularly when it comes to foreign interests. How would you, how would a libertarian approach to America's role in the world look like under your administration? 
Well, I think it's time uh, that we stop trying to export our values via militarism, via the bomb and the bullet. I'm somebody who believes in free markets, free trade, and voluntary exchange. I think that's a better way to forge relationships with our international neighbors. You know, if I'm buying something from you or, or selling something to you, uh, there's a good uh, reason for us not to want to shoot at each other and bomb each other. And so I think forging market relationships, tearing down protectionism that we've seen both from Donald Trump and then now recently doubled and tripled down on with these tariffs uh, from Joe Biden, I think that we can tear down these barriers and actually start to uh, export our values via diplomacy and trade and instead of bombing people around the world, which is what we've done my entire adult life. How did you become a member of the Libertarian Party? Well, you know, I became a member, the first time I was introduced to the Libertarian Party, you know, I was a disaffected Obama voter in 2010, uh, being part of the anti-war movement. And I happened to wander upon the Libertarian Party of Georgia. They were uh, out there at the Atlanta Pride Festival uh, with their candidates. Their candidate for governor literally waved me into the tent and helped me connect my anti-war views with the kind of the greater philosophy of liberty. And uh, my journey that started there, and I was a full-fledged party member by 2014. I got to vote for Gary Johnson in 2012. It was my first vote for a Libertarian candidate for president. But uh, really, it's been a journey from 2010 to about 2014. Uh, now I'm a hardcore Libertarian running for president. Oliver Chase is the Libertarian Party's presidential nominee on C-SPAN's Washington Journal program Friday morning. Independent Voter News reports that Oliver Chase is one of three presidential candidates confirmed to take part in the Free and Equal Election Foundation's second presidential debate on July 12th in Las Vegas. The others are Jill Stein of the Green Party and Randall Terry from the Constitution Party. This is Washington Today. Reuters reports that with a renewed ceasefire push in the eight-month-old Gaza war stalled, Israel bombarded central and southern areas again on Friday, killing at least 28 Palestinians, and tank forces advanced to the western edges of Rafah. U.S.-backed Qatari and Egyptian mediators have tried again this week to reconcile clashing demands preventing a halt to the hostilities, release of Israeli hostages and Palestinians jailed in Israel, and an unrestricted flow of aid into Gaza to alleviate a humanitarian disaster. But sources close to the talk said there were still no signs of a breakthrough. That was from Reuters. At the United Nations in New York City, spokesperson for the Secretary General, Stefan Dejaric, said at a news conference that Israel and Hamas will be added to a list in an upcoming report as parties engaged in the killing and maiming of children and in attacks on schools, hospitals, and protected persons in relation to schools and or hospitals. The annual report of the Secretary General Children in Armed Conflict is due to go to the Security Council on 14th June, which is next Friday. That is the date it is scheduled and asked for by the Security Council. As per usual practice, an advance copy will be delivered to Security Council members on that date. The report will be officially published on 18 June with a press conference by Virginia Gamba, the Secretary General Special Representative on the issue. Um, it will then be, the report will then be discussed by the Security Council members in an open debate. That will take place on 26 uh, June. Uh, and just to remind you a bit about the context of the report, this is an initiative of member states, more specifically of the Security Council members who have tasked secretaries general to report annually on this issue based on well-established methodology. Uh, coming back to this morning's events, earlier today, our chief of staff, uh, Courtney Rotre, called the permanent representative of Israel, uh, Gilad Erdan. The call was a courtesy afforded to countries that are newly listed on the annex of the report. It is done to give those countries a heads up and avoid leaks. Uh, Ambassador uh, Erdogan's video recording of that phone call and the partial release of that recording on Twitter is shocking and unacceptable, and frankly something I've never seen in my 24 years serving this organization. Stefan Dujaric, a spokesperson for the United Nations Secretary General at his news conference today at the UN in New York City. And here is that posted video he mentioned of Israeli ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdogan, on the phone. I am utterly shocked and disgusted by this shameful decision of the Secretary General. Courtney, you know that Israel's army is the most moral army in the world. So this immoral decision will only aid the terrorists and reward Hamas. 
And I have to tell you another thing. The only one who is blacklisted today is the Secretary General, whose decisions since the war started and even before are rewarding terrorists and incentivizing them to use children for terror acts. And now Hamas will continue even more to use schools and hospitals because this decision, shameful decision of the Secretary General, will only give Hamas hope to survive and will only extend the war and extend the suffering. Shame on him. Israeli Ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdogan, on the phone with the UN Secretary General's office. Ambassador putting up that video as Israel is informed that they'll be labeled as killing and maiming children in an upcoming UN report. Fox Business White House correspondent Edward Lawrence posting on X, White House block has security fencing around it ahead of expected protest tomorrow. The fencing like the fencing around the U.S. Capitol after January 6th. This fencing circles the White House, old executive office building and Treasury Department. The Answer Coalition posting on X tomorrow, June 8th, we will be establishing hashtag the people's red line for Rafa. And they attach this video. Tomorrow, June 8th, down at the White House, we will be establishing the people's red line for Rafa. U.S. President Joe Biden has said that Rafa was a red line. Joe Biden lied. Israel invaded Rafa, and yet the Biden administration still allowed in aids and weapons to continue this genocide. This shows that not only the Biden administration, but the whole of the U.S. government continues to not only support the ongoing genocide against the Palestinians, but they uphold the existence of the Jim Crow apartheid state of Israel itself. And so that is why people from all across the country will be coming to Lafayette Park this Saturday at noon here in Washington, D.C., wearing red to surround the White House and show that we, the people, are the real conscience in this country, that we are the real voices for peace in this country, and that despite anything that the Biden administration says or does to try to scuttle the Palestinian liberation movement or to try to put an end to our solidarity, we will continue to say free Palestine and all USA to Israel. A video on X from the ANSWER Coalition. ANSWER stands for Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. story from the Associated Press. The U.S. military-built pier designed to carry badly needed aid into Gaza by boat has been reconnected to the beach in the besieged territory after a section broke apart in storms and rough seas and food and other supplies will begin to flow soon, U.S. Central Command announced Friday. Washington Today continues in a moment. The House will be in order. This year, C-SPAN celebrates 45 years of covering Congress like no other. Since 1979, we've been your primary source for Capitol Hill, providing balanced, unfiltered coverage of government, taking you to where the policies debated and decided, all with the support of America's cable companies. C-SPAN, 45 years and counting, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. U.S. job growth, right? CNN, shot much higher than expected in May, jumping to 272,000, while the nation's jobless rate rose slightly and broke a 27-month streak of below 4% unemployment. At a time when Americans in the Federal Reserve are clamoring for clear-cut data about the state and trajectory of the economy, Friday's jobs report was much more opaque than everyone had hoped. That was from CNN. The acting Labor Secretary Julie Su was interviewed today on Bloomberg TV. We've got a bit of a mixed signal here in this jobs report. More payrolls than expected and a higher unemployment rate than expected. Which survey, household or establishment, is reflecting reality? Well, this is another very strong jobs report. I'm not going to get tired of coming here and telling you (laughs) that we are continuing to experience very strong, stable, and steady growth. So it's 272,000 jobs created last month. Mm -hmm. The unemployment rate has remained at or below 4% for 30 months straight. That's still the longest since the 1960s. And at the same time, real wages, you know, over over the year are up 4.1%. So uh, workers are doing better in an economy economy in which the president has said when we focus on workers and worker well-being, we're going to do what's right for uh, the economy and for the country. 
the acting Labor Secretary Julie Su interviewed on Bloomberg TV. Story from Politico, the labor market may still be hot, but the pro-Trump super PAC MAGA Inc. is using the better-than-expected jobs report released Friday to hit President Joe Biden on another front, immigration. The Labor Department's report that the U.S. economy added 272,000 jobs in May, quote, paints a dire picture for the American economy, MAGA Inc. wrote in a press release titled, May Jobs Report, Immigrants Win While Native-Born Americans Lose. The release cites a decrease in the number of native-born Americans who are employed and an increase in the number of foreign-born workers who had jobs in May compared to April. That was from Politico. (laughs) Wall Street today, the Dow down 87, Nasdaq down 39, S&P down 5. Story in the Baltimore banner for her first major campaign appearance in the general election, U.S. Senate candidate Angela also Brooks went right to the top of American politics, appearing alongside Vice President Kamala Harris on Friday to promote gun violence prevention. Harris offered an enthusiastic endorsement for also Brooks, saying that she'll help Democrats keep the majority in the Senate and pass common sense gun control laws. The two were in Landover, Maryland. Angela also Brooks spoke first. We will not accomplish these goals to keep Americans safe without a Senate majority. And I want you to know that it has become the case that the path to the majority runs through Maryland. And I couldn't be prouder because let me tell you that I am a part of a team, Team Maryland. Many of my colleagues are here today. I wish to recognize all of my friends and sisters and brothers in elective service who are here today. Can you stand? There's so many. I want to recognize them who are here today. And also want to recognize the captain of Team Maryland, Governor Wes Moore, who is here as well, and to thank him for his leadership. And I'm looking forward to, I see our delegation is there, Senator Van Hollen, so looking forward to being with you, Congressman Ivey, and others. This is an issue that I have dealt with so often as a public servant. But I want you to know that I am here today because I am also a mother, a mother who realized that my own daughter and her peers had to make adjustments and learn protocols to be safe in the classroom. When we talk about unacceptable realities, it is an unacceptable reality that we send our kids into schools now and then expect them to practice protocols, how to dive under a desk, how to lock the classroom doors from inside. This is a reality that I do not accept. We have placed the burden of really this scourge that is in our country on the backs of children. And we have done so because the adults lack the courage to do anything about this scourge that is overtaking our country. Angela also Brooks, Maryland Democratic Senate nominee in Landover, Maryland today with Vice President Kamala Harris. It's bone chilling to think about what our young people have been going through in terms of the fear that they faced sitting in a classroom. And you know, in fact, I spoke to a younger student years ago and I, and we were on this subject and and, and the student said to me, yeah, you know, that's, that's why I don't like going to fifth period. And I said, why, sweetheart? And they said, well, because in that classroom there's no closet to hide it. Over the years, I've met with far too many parents who say a silent and sometimes out loud prayer every time they drop their child off at school or walk them to the school bus stop. And I've held the hands of far too many mothers and fathers to try and comfort them after their child was killed by gun violence, be it a mass shooting, or what we call everyday gun violence. So let us all agree, it does not have to be this way. It does not have to be this way. And it is a false choice to suggest that you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. I'm in favor of the Second Amendment and we need an assault weapons ban. Vice President Kamala Harris campaigning for Angela Alsobrooks, the Maryland Democratic U.S. Senate nominee today in Landover, Maryland, focused today on gun violence prevention as today is National Gun Violence Awareness Day.
Story from the Washington Post, while Maryland is all but certain to back President Biden in the fall, the state's open Senate seat has implications for the fate of Biden's agenda should he win a second term. Also, Brooks faces Republican nominee Larry Hogan, the former two-term governor who has attracted national attention for his unwillingness to back Donald Trump. The GOP recruited Hogan and helped bankroll his campaign, seeing the popular and pragmatic Hogan as the party's best shot in a generation to flip the seat in a state where registered Democrats outnumber Republicans two to one. Reporting from The Washington Post, Larry Hogan put out a new TV ad last week. I want to say this up front. In the Senate, Republicans can't count on my vote. But then again, neither can Democrats. If they want my vote, they'll have to do what is right for Maryland, not one political party. That's exactly what I did as your governor and exactly the kind of senator I'll be. I'm Larry Hogan, and I approve this message because we won't fix Washington without independent, common-sense leaders who bring people together. TV ad from Republican Senate candidate, former governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan. He said this week that he will not be attending the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee in July, which is expected to nominate former President Donald Trump as the party's presidential nominee. KUOW The Seattle NPR station writes, with negotiations on Capitol Hill at a standstill, a 34-year-old federal benefits plan for survivors of the country's nuclear testing program is now set to expire on Friday. Legislation to reauthorize and expand the program known as the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA, has been stalled in the Republican-led House for months. Senators Ben Ray Lujan, Democrat of New Mexico, and Josh Hawley, Republican of Missouri, have pushed to expand RECA to cover others sickened by fallout from the atomic bomb testing program. Both have seen the impacts on constituents in their own states and want the program to recognize uranium mine workers and so-called downwinders caught in the path of toxic exposure. Although the legislation passed in the Democratic-led Senate numerous times in recent months, House Republicans, led by House Speaker Mike Johnson, have failed to reach an agreement to put a new expanded version of the program before members for a vote. That was from the Seattle NPR radio station KUOW. Congresswoman Celeste Malloy, Republican from Utah, posted a video about this on Thursday. Hi, I want to give you an update on RECA, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. It's the Downwinders Fund. It's really important in Utah, especially in the 2nd Congressional District, and it's set to expire this weekend. I just want you to know that I'm working with Chairman Jordan of the Judiciary Committee and with Speaker Johnson in the House to make sure we can get a right-sized bill through that protects Utahns but doesn't end up spending a lot of money that's not related to radiation exposure and government action. So there's a Senate bill that's too big. It's dead on arrival in the House. Harriet Hageman in Wyoming has a bill that marries up downwinders and uranium miners. That one may be able to move through. And just in case, I have a clean reauthorization that we're working on trying to get through the House next week to make sure that there's not a lapse in the authorization for the downwinders fund because Utahns who are exposed to radiation should be covered by this fund that the government has already accepted liability for. We know the mushroom clouds cause cancer. We know it's the federal government's fault. This isn't a question of whether it's is an appropriate government program. We just need to get it reauthorized. Congresswoman Celeste Malloy, Republican from Utah, in a video posted Thursday, also posted Thursday, a video from Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, Democrat from New Mexico. RICA expires June 10th. Speaker Johnson disappointed all of us when he failed to put on the floor of the House for a vote the Senate bill, which would expand RICA to include the downwinders, the remediation workers, the post-1971 uranium miners, and all of the other communities from Missouri to Guam who have been impacted by our nuclear testing program. I can tell you, we are not going to stop fighting until we get RICA expanded and reauthorized. You can count on all of us who are fighting for you to get this done. We know what justice looks like, and we are going to make sure it happens. Remember, there's a June 10th deadline. If you can get your claim postmarked that day, day, it will get considered. June 10th, get your claim postmarked. You still have time. Congresswoman Teresa Ledger-Fernandez, Democrat from New Mexico, posting that video on Thursday. 
More from the KOUW Seattle NPR article. Since 1990, RICA has provided lump sum payments of up to $75,000 to the so-called atomic veterans and others sickened by the nuclear testing program. The plan administered by the Justice Department has dispersed $2.7 billion in payments to more than 40,000 recipients. House Republicans have opposed the expansion of the plan over the cost, but RICA sponsors say they've already addressed those concerns. They say a 2023 estimate projecting the program's cost of $143 billion has since been shaved down to $50 billion to $60 billion instead. The United States Senate PAGE program lets high school juniors across the country come live and attend school in Washington, D.C. while working on the Senate floor each day, learning firsthand about government and democracy. On Wednesday, Senator Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey, said farewell to the current group of PAGEs. He read the top three winning entries in a page poem contest that he organized. And then he read his own poem. Here's the last couple of stanzas. At the doors, hurried senators literally pass you, but in the span of time, who's actually going to pass who? For you all, each of you will experience tomorrows that we never do. You are leaving here, my new young friends. This is now a beginning and not an end. You came here as individuals from all over the country. Now you are tight knit. You witnessed history here, but now it is time for you to separate again and make it. This nation needs each and every one of you. It needs your artistry. It needs your compassion. It needs your genius. It needs your love. This country needs your grit. It needs your struggle. It needs your firm belief in what is possible. And when this nation gets stuck, it needs your shove. We handed you our best speeches, our best words, and you took them all. But soon, our time will have been passed, and it's up to you to make America a more perfect union with liberty and justice for all. So my last piece of advice, and yes, this is an insulting poke. You guys really need to learn some much better jokes. The truth, and this is the truth, and I'm sorry it's not yet sunny, You guys are awful and not that funny. In fact, you're like cold, wet, soggy cereal. You've given me no good jokes. It's all just been awful material. So if this poem is going to have a final epitaph, it would be to give you this. Give the world everything you have, but never take yourself too seriously. Always remember to laugh. Senator Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey, on the Senate floor on Wednesday, reading a poem he wrote to the Senate pages, the high school students who've come to D.C. to work in the Senate and go to school, live in a dormitory on Capitol Hill, done with their time and, and are now leaving. And thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word. You'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org connect. Have a good night and weekend. 